Well, we're here this morning because of that Jesus, amen? Aren't you glad that the foot of the ground at Calvary is level? That was your chance to respond there, church, just so you know. Everybody's on the same page here. Aren't you glad this morning that when you come to the cross, the ground is level. Everybody is welcome, no matter what your background, no matter what your baggage, no matter where you come from or what you've done, the ground at Calvary is level. Amen? Amen. I'm so thankful for that. In Galatians chapter 3, verse number 28, talks about identity. We've been in this series called Identity Theft, where we are looking at our identity in Christ Jesus. Who does he say that we are in him? Because if we know who he is, the the most important question that we can answer, who do you say that Jesus is? Then the next question that we've got to be able to answer is who we are. Who does he say that we are? What is our identity in him? And Galatians chapter 3 has this to say, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? So the ground is level at the cross. And when we all come to that cross, it doesn't matter what our income is or what our tax bracket or what social class we belong to or what country club we've joined. It doesn't matter what our background. We come and we fall prostrate before God, repenting of our sin and saying, yes, Lord, I want to follow Jesus. That's our identity. And this letter to the church at Ephesus that we've been in in this series called Identity Theft, man, the enemy wants to tear away from you who you are in Jesus. He wants to distract you from your true identity, what Jesus has said about you. Friends, that you are redeemed. Amen? That you are adopted children of the one true king. That makes you princesses and princes, right? Sons and daughters of the king of kings and lord of lords. He's adopted you in. You are forgiven. You are chosen. God has a plan for you. You are sanctified. You are justified. And all of these things we see in this letter to the church at Ephesus, all of these realities of who we are as followers of Jesus. But once we come into chapter 4, what really happens is we turn the corner now from our theology to our practice, from what is right doctrine to now what is right practice. How do we live? It's the therefore. Therefore, what now do we do with this information of who we are in Christ Jesus? And so, Chapter 4, verse number 1 says, walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And throughout the text, what Paul is going to do in chapter 4 and 5 really is he's going to kind of unpack what that worthy walking looks like. Number one, that we would walk in unity. That, That we would zealously pursue oneness as a body of believers that we would be servants, service-minded. How are we serving one another? That we would walk in the newness of life. Therefore, the old things have passed away. All things have become new. So walk in the, the new man, the new life, not in the flesh, not in the old man. And then he's gonna turn his attention to walking in love. And then he's gonna talk about walking as light. And that's what Noah preached on just a couple of weeks ago, that we would walk as light. And then last week we talked about walking in wisdom. And wisdom kind of had some components of its own, of what does it mean to walk in wisdom. And the first thing was that we, we, we would walk in wisdom when it comes to our corporate worship. And then out of our corporate worship would be our personal devotion, that if we're going to live a spirit-filled life of wisdom, that we would be persistently thankful. And then we ended our sermon last week with how we're going to begin this week, which is that our lives must be characterized by humble and mutual submission. This morning, I hope that you have your notes from 
the bulletin because there are some places that you're going to be able to follow along with us uh, throughout all of this. But listen, we've, we've got to be about mutual submission. I want you to make an altar right where you are just for a moment. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I want you to repeat after me. We're going to say this prayer together. Lord God, you are first, and I am second. I want you to open your eyes. I want you to look to the person to your left. I want you to say, you are first, and I am second. Now, the person on your right, you are first, and I am second. In our lives, what we have to embrace, folks, is we have to combat the flesh, which tries to tell us that we're first, that we've got to look out for number one, that we're the greatest, that we want to be in first place. There's a tremendous ministry that's by that name, I Am Second. In fact, um, if you ever notice, I, I always wear a watch and, and a couple of uh, wristbands, and the watch tells me the time, right? Now, mine's a smart watch, so it tells me all kinds of other fun stuff too, but really, I wear it because I, I got to know what time it is, right? I got to make sure I get to the, the right places at the right time and meet with the right folks, and it helps me to do that. But there's one particular band that I always wear, and I don't know if you can see it, but it is that logo right there. I am second. You see, because one of these tells me the time, but the other one tells me my place. In every relationship in my life, I should strive to be second. Whether that is my relationship with my God, or with my wife, or with my children, or my neighbors, or fellow church members, in every relationship, it should be my desire to strive to be second second place, to serve others, to consider their needs as more important than my own, consider them more important than myself. Would you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5? I want us to start where we ended last week because I think it's vitally important, and we're going to read one, one verse together and then I'm going to have some friends read some verses in just a little bit. But I want you to stand with me, if you would. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 21. I'm going to, I'm going to read this out loud. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bible uh, right there. But I'm just going to read this. Thank you for standing in honor of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 21. Paul says this, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Lord God, thank you for your word. God, as we unpack what it means to be second in every relationship that we have, Lord, we pray that we would honor you in second place because you are in first place in our lives. God, we glorify you. We love you. And God, we pray that you would help us to live in second place by honoring and serving and loving other people the way that we have been loved and served, even by you. Because even Jesus, our example, our model, said that he came to seek and to save the lost, to be a servant, that if we wanted to be the greatest in the kingdom, that we must become a servant to everyone else. Lord, help us to serve. Help us to have an attitude of humility and mutual submission. We love you, and we thank you, and we pray that you would open our ears, our eyes, our minds, that we might hear from you, that we might see your glory, and that we might be transformed from the inside out. Maybe today would be the day of salvation for someone here who has never made the decision to follow Jesus. Would they do that today? God, draw people unto yourself. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Listen, friends, a, a primary sign of spirit-filled wisdom, a, a lifestyle that is 
walked worthy of the high calling of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is humility and mutual submission towards one another. Mutual submission. Maybe you're like me and you think, I'm not really sure I understand what you're talking about here, Pastor John. I submit in the Greek language simply means to rank under someone. It's a military term. And it means to rank under somebody. It means to voluntarily give up your place for someone else. And this comes as no surprise that it is difficult for you and I to do this. Because when we start talking about submission, our skin begins to crawl. It's an awkward confrontation with everything inside of us that says, I want everybody else to submit to me, to serve me, to meet my needs, my expectations. And so we don't want to be subject to anyone else. We want to, we want to rank higher than anybody. We want to be the commanding officer. We don't want to have the attitude of giving in. Who loves to give in in an argument? Raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, very few people really want to give in. And sometimes the only reason that they want to give in is just to end the confrontation. But not because they actually want to give in, but just because they don't like the conflict. And I can understand that, but the truth is it goes against our very nature to want to give in or to carry somebody else's burden to serve them, to yield the right of way, right? It's kind of like, you know, what, what happens at a four-way stop in Canada when there are four cars, right? Nobody goes anywhere because they're all too nice, right? They just, they just stand right there, okay? That's, that's kind of what happens, right? And this, this, us as Americans, we're like, well, I was here a split second before you. We're not going to yield, right? We, we want to go, and we want to go, and we want to have our way, right? Think of it this way. We, we live in a Burger King society. You guys remember when McDonald's came out, it was such a revolutionary idea. They had so many customers. But the thing about McDonald's was that you had to get whatever they gave you. When you went to McDonald's in the earliest years of it opening, they had a particular way that they made a hamburger or a shake or fries. And when you ordered a number one or you ordered the burger and the fries, you got it the way that it was made. It was very strict. It was very structured. And then Burger King came along. Anybody remember Burger King's slogan? Have it your way, which has changed, by the way. Now it's be your way. They're trying to get into some identity issues. Uh, but it used to be have it your way. And the whole branding marketing ploy of Burger King was that you didn't just have to take it however McDonald's gave it to you. You could go to Burger King and order your Whopper however you wanted it to come. Pickles, no pickles, ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, whatever you wanted, cheese, no cheese, you could have it your way. And the truth is we have, we have kind of embraced that wholesale in our society, haven't we? Now, whenever you go to any restaurant, any fast food joint, you have a particular way that you want your chicken sandwich to come or your hamburger to come, and we've embraced that. We want to have it our way all the time. In fact, pride is lauded as a virtue in our culture. And we have an entitlement mentality in America, don't we? Don't trample on my rights. Don't tread on me. Those are, those are my rights. And submission, mutual submission to one another, instead means that we are willing to give up our rights in order to serve someone else. And that doesn't sit well with us very often. You know, Proverbs 16, verse number 18, it is, says this, that pride goes before destruction. An arrogant attitude, haughtiness, comes before a fall. James chapter 4, verse number 6, I think, paints it in even more stark language. This is what it says. God opposes the proud. You know, I don't know about you folks, but in my life, I don't want God to be my opponent. Do you? 
You know, the sovereign creator of the universe that holds everything together, right? The, the, the one who dotted the stars in the sky, right? Who, who breathed the universe into existence, who said, let there be light, and the light from billions of burning stars in the universe began to shine at his command. You want that guy to be opposed to you? Then be proud. So that's what his word says. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Friends, I don't know about you, but I need more grace. I need, I need more of God's unmerited favor, not because of anything that I do or don't do, but just because he is gracious and merciful and because of his great love, just want more grace. And so, friends, we've got to adopt that mentality of humility. Living in second place is the foundation for humble and mutual submission. We've got to live in second place. We've got to be willing to see others as more important than ourselves. And where do we get that picture? You know, John chapter 3, verse number 30, John the Baptist was a pretty uh, influential character. And here's this cousin of Jesus Christ, and he's been doing ministry for so many years, and he's been preaching repentance especially to these self-righteous religious people, the Jews. And Jesus comes onto the scene. And John the Baptist declares, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he baptizes Jesus and says, I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals, and you want me to baptize you? And Jesus convinces them to do so. And he's baptized in God's Favor pours out and appears in the form of a dove descending upon him. Confirmation that this is the Messiah that the people have so long waited for. But then Jesus begins to do ministry. And Jesus' disciples begin to do ministry. And across the Jordan, they begin to baptize folks that are coming to Jesus. And John's followers, John's disciples, go to John the Baptist and they say, everybody's going to Jesus. Everybody's going to, to him. And John has this to say. He must become greater. I must become less. You know, my prayer always is I've ever assumed the, the pulpit, I've ever, ever come before a congregation to share from the Word of God is that I would disappear as God becomes greater. Not that you would hear from me, but that you would hear from Him, from His Word. That's why I preach the Bible, because I don't really have anything good to say aside from Scripture. That He would increase even as I decrease. I love uh, Casting Crown's new album, it's called Only Jesus. Casting Crowns just so happens to be one of my favorite Christian bands out there. And this uh, album, Only Jesus, is all about this idea. That the only name that you need to remember, it, it isn't John Morton, it isn't, it isn't Mark Hall from Casting Crowns, it, it isn't the names of famous preachers like Charles Stanley or Jerry Falwell or even Billy Graham. The only name that you need to remember is Jesus. Because life is not about us. I said life is not about us. It's all about Jesus. Sometimes it's easy to say and hard to do, isn't it? But he's our example. Jesus is the one who gives us his own example of humble Submission, subduing pride and selfish pursuits. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3 and following says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Did you catch that? Count others as more significant than yourselves. Believe in your heart of hearts that other people are more important than you are. 
Are we stepping on any toes this morning? Because mine are black and blue from this week of studying. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. That word there is slave. Being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You think Jesus modeled for us mutual submission? You think Jesus modeled for us what it means to sacrifice your own desires in order to serve and love others? Even to the point of death on a cross. Therefore, the motivation for our own surrender is Jesus Christ. And that's what it says. Submitting to one another. Back to verse number 21, Ephesians 5. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not just because Jesus is our example of mutual submission, but because the fear of Christ is the ground upon which we are able to praise. It's the ground, the fertile ground where we are able to obey and see fruit come forth. The, the fear. When we think of a word like that, we're, sometimes we get a little confused. It's um, respect. It's reverence for who Jesus is, for his power, for his holiness, and friends, for his coming judgment. Don't ever forget, Jesus is coming back. Amen? Amen? But when he does, it will be as the conquering king. It will be as the judge of the quick and the dead, those who are alive and those who have gone on before, to measure you and me, to evaluate our lives. And friends, that is a fearful, scary idea. It should be. It's weighty. And it calls for us to walk worthy of his name because we carry his name as Christians, little Christs, followers of Jesus. And so Paul begins to turn his attention as he calls us to live in second place, as he calls us to mutual submission, he turns his attention to what we call Household codes. In the New Testament age, in this first century, uh, there were a lot of literature that was being made about household codes. And what that meant was these were guidelines for different authority relationships inside of the home. Because, friends, you, you, you got to understand, we, we rank ourselves under in mutual submission because. Every organization has to have chiefs and Indians, right? If we want there to be an effective ministry, then even within the church, we've got to be willing to submit to authority structures. And so he turns his attention to the home. And in the home, there were three authority structures. And that was, number one, husbands and wives. Number two, children and parents. And number three, slaves and masters. In these, in these three structures, we start with husbands and wives. My wife, I, I love my wife. Y'all know I love my wife. I talk about my wife a lot in, uh, in, in my sermons, and uh, she just kind of elbows me sometimes. And last night, uh, we, were, we were talking together, and uh, she, she was kind of reiterated something uh, about, you know, I, I tend to be a long-winded preacher. Anybody say Amen. Yep, I knew it. All right, so, so I get that, and, and, we, and we joke about that a little bit. But here's the thing. Brittany said, you know, I could preach this sermon in no time flat, three minutes or less. All right? Husbands love your wives. Children obey your parents. Slaves obey your masters. The end, go home. We can finally beat the Methodists to lunch. And, and when she first told me that, I said, you know, I find it interesting that you 
that you skipped a section, didn't you? Anybody notice the section that she skipped? I say, you remembered husbands love your wives and children obey your parents and slaves obey your masters, but you missed the first one. Wives submit to your husbands. I said, is that our irony or what? Right there. I wonder if that was intentional, honey, you know? But Paul begins with this relationship between husbands and wives. A beautiful picture. It's an ideal of God's divine design. It's hard to live out. But it's important for us to investigate. And so maybe you're thinking, we're going to talk about husbands and wives. I'm not even married. Maybe you should begin to capture these characteristics in case ever God brings you a husband or a wife. To be the type of person who lives in second place, in mutual submission one to another. And so we're going to look at this together. And I've asked a friend uh, to read the first part. It's the strongest human bond that God designed, marriage. Right? He looked at the man. There wasn't a partner for him. He said, it's not good for men to be alone. And so he created woman, fashioning her from his rib, putting him into a deep sleep. And when he woke up, he saw woman, and he said, whoa, man, and that stuck. That's how she got her name right there. And he, and he wrote a song for her right then and there, a beautiful piece of poetry that we'll look at in a little bit. But this first divine institution that God creates, one man and one woman for one lifetime, that's the biblical ideal of marriage. And so we start there knowing that good and biblical marriages are built on godly attitudes of love and respect. Love and respect. So I've asked one of my favorite couples. <laughs> I've had a chance to get to know them and pray with them and see them through some, some difficult circumstances these last uh, several months in particular. But I'll never forget as many years as they have been married... Uh, how many years have you been married, Soneses? What's that? 65 years married together. And when I went to the hospital, when Vaughn was having a procedure done, uh, I'll never forget the nurse as she's wheeling Vaughn away. Vaughn and Helen have a little kiss as he's being wheeled away. And the nurse says, hey, I need you to, to tell me how to, how to have a marriage like yours. How to make it last like yours. 65 years. And so that being said, Miss, Miss Helen, will you read for us the first few verses of chapter 5, verses 22 through 24, about wives and their responsibility. A word for wives. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. All right. So when I told Miss Helen that I wanted her to read this particular passage about wives submitting to their husbands, she said, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> right? And that's kind of the reaction that I get at weddings when I preach this passage. It's not a very popular teaching. Can you believe that? It's not. And, and I think maybe there might be a good reason why it's not a popular teaching, because it has been so often abused in our churches, in people that claim to be followers of Jesus who don't love well and yet expect submission. And maybe that was born even out of the culture that Paul and Jesus were trying to undermine using these teachings. Mutual submission. Mutual. Mutual means we're both submitting. 
And as we're going to find out, what God is calling the woman to do is submission, but what he's calling the husband to do for his wife is submitting his own will to provide nourishment and caring for her. Mutual, mutual submission. You think, well, how do you get that? Very first verse we read. Submit to your own husbands. You know, the beautiful thing about this is Paul is highlighting a peculiar relationship of intimate, personal possession. Possession, you say. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks a lot about marriage. And Paul says this, and husbands be reminded that your body is not your own, it belongs to your wife. And wives, you also be reminded your bodies do not belong to you, but to your husband. It is an intimate picture of possession. We think about possession. I don't like that word. I don't like to think that I am somebody else's property, somebody else's possession. No, you, you misunderstand. This is a beautiful picture of a unique relationship that is a reflection of Jesus and his bride, the church. And we have to embrace that for what it is. I have one wife. I've been married to the same woman for the last 12 years. And I love her more today than I did yesterday. And I mess up more often than I really care to admit. And she loves me anyway with forbearing love. And that is the picture that we want to portray, that we want to see, that we want to have. And God establishes an ordained leadership of the husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. And sometimes we think, well, the head of the wife, the, the authority structure over her. Remember, we're talking about mutual submission. This is the way God designed the family to operate. And when he says this, I think Beth Moore, uh, renowned Christian teacher, especially for women and women's Bible studies, she jokes about this even in uh, uh, the movie Prayer Room or, or War Room. And in this movie, she's having a conversation with the main character played by Priscilla Shire and their friends in real life and in the movie co-workers. And Beth Moore talks about what submission really is. And Beth Moore uses this even in her Bible study. She talks about submission is simply this. Submission is ducking low enough so God hits your husband instead of you. And it's true. God established the leadership of the husband, not, not because he wanted to show that you are inferior, ladies, not to show that you are some kind of second-class citizen, but for your own benefit, for your own blessing. It's a voluntary yielding. It's not blind obedience. There are some first-century cultural considerations. You know, in Judaism, women were basically property, about the same as slaves. There was inferiority and servitude and duty and heavy-handed, demeaning treatment of women in the first century. You know, the truth is that still goes on today, doesn't it? And that is not what Paul and what Jesus had in mind. Maybe to illustrate this, even outside of Judaism, in the culture that Ephesus was in, the, the churches in Asia Minor, here's something that I want to uh, share. The absence of the kind of love Paul describes as essential in marriage is well illustrated by the attitude of Amelius Paulus toward his wife, as told by Florence DuPont. Amelius Paulus had married Papiria, daughter of a former consul. Papiria was the perfect wife and gave her husband two sons, both of whom proved exceptional men. Socially, Papiria was everything that was expected of her. She was beautiful, virtuous, and fertile. 
Amelius Paulius, however, decided to divorce her. Why, he was asked, is she not discreet? Is she not beautiful? Is she not fruitful? Amelius Paulus then held out his shoe, saying, is this not handsome? Is it not new? But not one of you can see where it pinches my foot. So he married another woman. That's sad. But it illustrates the disposable nature of marriage in the first century. And today, friends, I think it may be even more disposable in our own culture than it was then. And what a shame. What a, what a shame. What a tremendously terrible turn of events. You know, there's a story about Winston Churchill and uh, Lady Nancy Astor. La- Lady Nancy Astor would later become the first member of English Parliament who was a woman. So these two had gathered together at uh, one of Winston Churchill's homes, and they were talking politics. And during the course of their conversation, Lady Nancy Astor said, Winston, if you were my husband, I would poison your tea. To which Winston Churchill, with his dry humor, said, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. I mean, that's that's kind of what Scripture talks about. Better, better. <laughs> They're basically a nagging wife. You'd, you'd rather just be on the edge of the roof, right? That's, that's the idea. And, and, it, and that's the illustration. So why would any woman want to submit herself to her husband? I mean, why adopt this complementarian position that's so out of date and out of culture now? Why, why would we do that? Why, why even maintain gender distinction at all? Genesis chapter 3 tells the story. And God created this perfect relationship, designing the woman for the man and the man for the woman, that they would be partners together. But sin and the curse came in and destroyed what God had intended. And so the woman... God said after they had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And here it comes. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. What God had intended to be a relationship of mutual submission got turned into an authority structure where the Man would wield control over his wife as she desired always to usurp that authority from him. Anybody else ever seen that in our marriages, in our nation, in our culture? And so God is calling us back to the mutual submission that he had designed. God's standard for marriage and the family produces meaning, happiness, blessedness, reward, and fulfillment, and it is the only standard that can produce those results. Pastor John MacArthur said these words, and I want you to understand something. We stand upon the biblical truth that God's ideal for marriage and sexuality is one man and one woman for one lifetime. That's it. That's it. And we stand on that because we know it to be true because it is God's standard and because he is the creator, he is the designer. It's his word that shows us what is going to bring that kind of joy and purpose and blessing and reward. And when we step outside of God's design, that's when we see the destruction. That's when we see the failures. And so let's step back into God's design and his word and his will. How about a word for Christian husbands? Vaughn, would you read for us Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 31. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word 
and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no other, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does for the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Friends, what I want you to understand is that complete self-sacrificing love from a godly husband removes all fear of submitting to his authority. Because you'd want to follow the leadership of someone who loves you so much to submit his own will and his own desires in order to serve you. Am I right? Ladies, that's, that's the kind of man that you want to, to follow. That's, that's the kind of godly, Jesus-following husband that you would have no fear submitting to. But it's the ideal, isn't it? And so often life is not so idyllic. But it does show that God, Christ's standard of self-sacrifice is the characteristic love that he demands from us as husbands. That we would love our wives that way. Love from agapao, agape love in the New Testament. To seek the highest good for another person. Their highest good, not mine. Not my preferences, wants, or desires, theirs, their needs. And it has a sanctifying influence on our wives. This is what it says, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Friends, when we love our wives well, the way that Christ has modeled for his bride, the church, when we sacrifice of ourselves in that way, it draws her to her Savior. It draws her to God's will for her own life. Today, brides prepare themselves, right? When they're getting ready for the wedding day, on that day, I wasn't even allowed to see Brittany that day. And she was getting her hair done and glitter everywhere and flowers and attaching the veil and getting all dolled up, right? Makeup and nails and hair and the whole works. This talks about the preparation of the bride, the washing of the water with the word. Right, today, brides prepare themselves, and Jesus is talking about here preparing his own bride for himself, making her more and more like Jesus teaching her in holiness, expecting us as husbands to lead her in that venture into holiness and purity. That's our, a Christian husband's chief aim, is leadership unto purity and holiness, cleansing by the word of God. That's what provides the cleansing. That's what brings her to sanctification. And it indicates with the body language the kind of oneness and unity and intimacy that is desired. Husbands, loving your wives as your own body. You take care of your own body. You feed it and you provide security and protection. And in the same way that you would nourish and cherish your bride, your wife, with provision and security and warm affection was God's design, his plan for marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus refers to his church as his bride. Paul goes on to finish it out. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Christian marriage is the visual expression of Christ's love 
to an unbelieving world. Did you catch that? I'm going to say it one more time, okay? Christian marriage is the visual expression of Christ's love to an unbelieving world. If that is true, how are we doing, church? We, we divorce as often as the unbelieving world. Our marriages tend to be disposable at best. Our, our Christian men struggle with pornography addiction at rates that are pretty much dead on with the rest of the world. Sexual sin and perversion and adultery and divorce plague our nation. And so, should it come as any surprise that when people want to redefine marriage, we don't really have much of a leg to stand on, do we? As a church, we have utterly failed to live this way, to live in second place, to serve each other well. And so he ends with that restatement of marital duties, love and respect, mutual submission, to move from I do to I'm doing. How are we doing that? Friends, this is, this is where we have to be willing to break the cycle. You know, I have, I have exactly one tattoo. Many of you know about it. You've seen it before. It's uh, my, we- my wedding ring. Several years ago, I got this tattoo because as Brittany and I were going through pre-marriage counseling, we had been uh, engaged for almost two years, and we had been dating for almost five. And the pastor that we began to do some pre-marriage counseling with had us do an exercise where we took a look at all of the relationships in our family history, our parents, our grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, and to look at their marriages. And Brittany, by and large, her family had marriages that stayed together and they loved one another well, and mine was quite the opposite. In fact, in doing the exercise, what we found was that there was not one marriage on my father's side, my mother's side, step-parents, there wasn't one marriage that had stood the test of time. Not one. That was an unexpected legacy of divorce that I was not really prepared for, but it gave me a certain resilience for what God wanted me to do as a husband that he was calling me to break that chain, to break that cycle in my own marriage. And the only way that I could do that was by his power and his strength. Because, friends, I mess up. Even last night, I said something to Brittany I shouldn't have said. I disrespected her, and she had to correct me on that. And because of mutual submission, I have to be willing to say, you know what, honey, you are right. And I was wrong, and I'm sorry. And for why would Paul spend so much time on husbands and wives? Because it's the picture. And our picture right now is a mess in the church. But friends, we've got to do better. Wives, we, we, we've got to submit. Husbands, we've got to love well love and respect the way that God has called us to. And we're not going to shy away from these things. We're going to embrace them knowing that this is God's divine design. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, well, I'm not really married. I'm not married. I'm single. Maybe you're, maybe you're dating. Maybe you're not. Maybe you have embraced singleness as the godly biblical gift that he calls it in his word. Or maybe you're embracing marriage for the gift that it is. Whatever it is that you are going through today, whatever your season of life, whatever your situation or your circumstance, what I want you to understand is that God is calling you to live in second place. 
Consider the needs of others is more important than your own. Serve. Love. Submit for the benefit of others. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? You know, I don't know where you are in your own life right now. I don't want to know what situation you're in. I don't know if maybe you're listening to all of this and you're thinking, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus. Or maybe you're thinking, I, I'm far from him. Whatever it is that you need to do, this is your time of invitation. You make an altar right where you are. You have a conversation with your heavenly father and you say, Maybe you just need to say, Lord, I'm ready to follow you. I believe that you demonstrated such great love for me when you died on the cross to save me. I'm ready to follow you. Maybe, maybe you're a long way from the Lord because you've turned your back on him. And maybe it's just time to come home. Maybe today you just need to come forward and say, you know what, I'm ready to join in the mission of Oak Grove Baptist Church. Or maybe there are some husbands and wives in this room that need to start loving and respecting one another the way that God has called us to. To repent of your own sin. And say, God, I, I want to be the husband, I want to be the wife that you've called me to be. Maybe you're a single person and you need to begin to live in second place in every relationship that you have. Lord God, would you help us to do that this morning? Would you help us to live in second place? Would you help us to submit one to another, to consider the needs of others as more important than our own, to love other people well the way that you have? God, you were speaking to us this morning in this room, and God, we pray that we would respond in faith transform us from the inside out this morning and help us to become more and more like Jesus each and every day. We love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.